we come to chapter 49, in which Smike is restored to his friends and Nicholas falls in love. Once more out of the clutches of his old persecutor, it needed no fresh stimulation to call forth the utmost energy and exertion that Smike was capable of summoning to his aid. Without pausing for a moment to reflect upon the course he was taking or the probability of its leading homewards or the reverse, he fled away with surprising swiftness and constancy of purpose, borne upon such wings as only fear can wear, and impelled by imaginary shouts of the well-remembered voice of Squealers, who, with a host of pursuers, seemed to be to the poor fellow's disordered senses to press hard upon his track. And now left at a greater distance in the, year, in the rear, and now gaining faster and faster upon him as the alterations of hope and terror agitated him by turns. Long after he had become assured that these sounds were but the creation of his own excited brain, he still held on at a pace which even weakness and exhaustion could scarcely retard. It was not until the darkness and quiet of a country road recalled him to a sense of external objects and the starry sky above warned him of the rapid flight of time, that covered with dust and pausing for breath, he stopped to listen and look about him. All was still and silent. A glare in the distance, casting a warm glow upon the sky, marked where the huge city lay. Solitary fields divided by hedges and ditches through many of which he had crashed and scrambled in his flight, skirted the road, both by the way he had come and upon the opposite side. It was late now. They could scarcely trace him by such paths as he'd taken. And if he could hope again to regain his own dwelling, it must surely be at such a time as that and under the cover of darkness. This by degrees became pretty plain even to the mind of Smike. He had at first entertained some vague and childish idea of travelling into the country for 10 or 12 miles and then returning homewards by a wide circuit which should keep him clear of London. So great was his apprehension of traversing the streets alone lest he should encounter his dreaded enemy. But yielding to the conviction which these thoughts inspired, he turned back and taking the open road, though not without many fears and misgivings, made for London again, with scarcely less speed than that with which he had left the temporary abode of Mr Squeers. By the time he re-entered it at the western extremity, the greater part of the shops were closed. Of the throngs of people who had been tempted abroad after the heat of the day, but a few remained in the streets and they were lounging home but of these he asked his way from time to time, and by dint of repeated inquiries, at length he reached the dwelling of Newman Noggs. All that evening, Newman had been hunting and searching in the byways and corners for the very person who now knocked at his door. While Nicholas had been pursuing the same inquiry in other directions, Newman was sitting with a melancholy air at his poor supper when Mike's timorous and uncertain knock reached his ear. Alive to every sound in his anxious and expectant state, Newman hurried downstairs and uttering a cry of joyful surprise, dragged the welcome visitor into the passage and up the stairs and said not a word until he had made him safe in his own garret and the door was shut behind him. When he mixed a great mug full of gin and water, and holding it to Smike's mouth as one might hold a bowl of medicine to the lips of a refractory child, commanded him to drain it to the last drop. Newman looked uncommonly blank when he found that Smike did little more than put it to his lips. He was in the act of raising the mug of his own, with a deep sigh of compassion for his poor friend's weakness when Smike, 
beginning to relate the adventures which had befallen him, arrested him halfway, and he stood listening with the mug in his hand. It was odd enough to see the change that came over Newman as Smike proceeded. At first he stood, rubbing his lips with the back of his hand as a preparatory ceremony towards composing himself for a draught. Then at the mention of Squeers, he took the mugger from under his arm and opening his eyes very wide, looked on in utmost astonishment. When Smike came to the assault upon himself in the hackney coach, he hastily deposited the mug upon the table and limped up and down the room in a state of great excitement, stopping with a jerk every now and then, as if to listen more attentively. When John Browdy came to be spoken of, he dropped by slow and gradual degree, degrees into a chair and rubbing his hands upon his knees quicker and quicker as the story reached its climax, burst at last into a laugh composed of one loud, sonorous, HA! HA! Having again given vent to which, his countenance immediately fell, as he inquire, inquired with the utmost anxiety whether it was probable that John Browdy and Squeers had come to blows. Oh, no, 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 I think not, replied Smike. I don't think he could have missed me till I'd got quite away. Newman scratched his head with a show of great disappointment. And once more, lifting up the mug, applied himself to the contents, smiling meanwhile over the, over the rim with a grim and ghastly smile at Smike. You shall stay here said Newman. You're tired, fagged. I'll tell them you're back. They've been driven half mad about you. Mr. Nicholas, God bless him, cried Smike. Amen, returned Newman. He hasn't had a moment's rest or peace, no more as the old lady, nor, nor, nor Miss Nickleby. No, no. Ha, has, has she thought about me? said Smike. Has she, though? Oh, has she? Has she? D -d -d don't tell me so if she has not. She has, cried Newman. She is as noble-hearted as she is beautiful. Yes, yes, cried Smike. W -w well said. So mild and gentle, said Newman. Yes, yes, yes cried Smike with increasing eagerness. And yet with such a true and gallant spirit, pursued Newman. He was going on in his enthusiasm when, chancing to look at his companion, he saw that Smike had covered his face with his hands and that tears were stealing out between the fingers. A moment before, the boy's eyes were sparkling with unwonted fire and every feature had been lighted up with excitement which made him appear for the moment quite a different being. Well, 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 muttered Newman as if he were a little puzzled. It has touched me more than once to think of such a, such a nature should have been exposed to such trials. This, this poor fellow, well, well, yes, yes, he... He, he feels that too. It, it softens him. It, it makes him think of his former misery. Uh, yes, that's it. Um, 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 it was by no means clear from the tone of these broken reflections that Newman Noggs considered them as explaining it at all satisfactorily the emotion which suggested them. He sat in a musing attitude for some time, regarding Smike occasionally with an anxious and doubtful gaze, which sufficiently showed that he was not very remotely connected with his thoughts. At length, he repeated his proposition that Smike should stay where he was for that night, and that he, Noggs, should straightway repair to the cottage to relieve the suspense of the family. But, as Smike would not hear of this, pleading his anxiety to see, to see his friends again. They eventually sallied forth together. And the night, being by this time far advanced, and Smike being besides so footsore that he could hardly crawl along, 
It was within an hour of sunrise when they reached their destination. At the first sound of their voices outside the house, Nicholas, who had passed a sleepless night devising schemes for the recovery of his lost charge, started from his bed and joyfully admitted them. There was so much noisy conversation and congratulation and indignation that the remainder of the family was soon awakened and Smike received a warm and cordial welcome, not only from Kate, but also from Mrs. Nickleby, who assured him of her future favour and regard, and was so obliging as to relate for his entertainment and that of the assembled circle, a, a most remarkable account extracted from some work, the name of which she had never known, of a miraculous escape from some prison, but what prison or escape she could not remember, effected by an officer whose name she had forgotten, confined for some crime which she didn't clearly recollect. At first, Nicholas was disposed to give his uncle credit for the same some portion of this bold attempt, which had so nearly proved successful to carry off Smike. But on mature consideration, he was inclined to think that the full merit of it rested with Mr. Squeers. Determined to ascertain, if he could, through John Browdy, how the case really stood, he betook himself to his daily occupation meditating as he went on a great variety of schemes for the punishment of the Yorkshire schoolmaster, all of which had their foundation in the strictest principles of retributive justice, and had but the one drawback of being wholly impracticable. A fine morning, Mr Lincolnwater, said Nicholas, entering the office. Ah, replied Tim. Talk of the country, indeed. What do you think of this now? A new day, a London day. It, it, it's a little clearer out of town, said Nicholas. Clearer? Echoed Tim Lincolnwater. You should see it from my bedroom window. <laughs> you should see it from mine, replied Nicholas with a smile. <laughs> said Tim Lincolnwater. Don't tell me about the country. Bow, where Nicholas and the family lived, was quite a rustic place to Tim. Nonsense! What can you get in the country but new laid eggs and flowers? Well, I can buy new laid eggs in Leaden Hall Market the morning after breakfast. And as fluff of flowers, it's worth a run upstairs to met to smell my mignonette, or to see the double wallflower in the back attic window at number six in the court. There's a double wallflower at number six in the court, is there? said Nicholas. Yes, there is, replied Tim. And it's planted in a cracked jug without a spout. There were hyacinths there last spring, blossom in... Well, will you laugh? At what? At their blossoming in old blacking bottles, said Tim. No, indeed, not I, returned Nicholas. Tim looked wistfully at him for a moment, as if he were encouraged by the tone of this reply to be more communicative on the subject. Sticking behind his ear a pen which he had been making and shutting up his knife with a smart click, he said, I'll tell you. The flowers belong to a sickly, bedridden humpback boy. And they seem to be his only pleasures, Mr. Nickleby. His only pleasures of his sad existence. How many years is it, said Tim, pondering, since I, I first noticed him? He quite a little child, dragging himself about on a pair of tiny crutches. Well, well, not so many. But though they would appear nothing, if I thought of other things, they seem a long time when I think of him. It's a sad thing, said Tim, breaking off, to see a little deformed child sitting apart from the other children who were active and merry, watching the games he is denied and the power to share in them. He made my a heart ache very often. 
That shows it is a good heart, said Nicholas. A heart that disentangles itself from the close avocations of every day to heed such things. You were saying, oh yes, that the flowers belong to this poor boy, said Tim. That's all. When it's fine weather and he can crawl out of bed, he draws a chair close to the window and, and sits there looking at them and arranging them all day long. We used to nod at first and then we came to speak. Formerly I, I, I called to him of a morning and asked him how he was. He would smile and say, better. But now he shakes his head and only bends more closely over his old plants. It must be dull to watch the dark house stops and the flying clouds from so many months. But he's very, very patient. Is there nobody in the house to cheer or help him? asked Nicholas. His father lives there, I believe, replied Tim, and other people too, but no one seems to care much for the poor sickly cripple. I've asked him very often if there was nothing I could do for him. His answer is always the same, nothing. His voice is growing weaker of late, but I can see that he makes the old reply. He can't leave his bed now, so that they've moved it close beside the window. And there he lies all day, now looking at the sky and now at his flowers, which he still makes shift to trim and water with his own hands. At night, when he sees my candle, he draws back his curtain and leaves it too, till I am gone to bed. It seems such company to him to know that I am there, that I often sit at my window for an hour, or more, that he might see I'm still awake, and sometimes I get up in the night to look at the dull, melancholy light in his little room, and wonder whether he's asleep or awake. The night will not be long in coming, said Tim, when he will sleep and never wake again on earth. We have never so much as shaken hands in all our lives, and yet I shall miss him like an old friend. Are there any country flowers that could interest me like these, do you think? Or do you suppose that the withering of a hundred kinds of the choicest flowers that blow, called by the hardest Latin names that were ever invented, would give me one fraction of the pain that I shall feel when those old jugs and bottles are swept away as lumber. Country! <sighs> that I could have had such a court under my bedroom window. Anywhere else? No, only in London. With which inquiry Tim turned his back and pretending to be absorbed in his accounts, took an opportunity of hastily wiping his eyes when he supposed that Nicholas was looking the other way. Whether it was that Tim's accounts were more than usually intricate that morning, or whether it was that his habitual serenity had been a little disturbed by these recollections, it so happened that when Nicholas returned from executing some commission and inquired whether Mr. Charles Cheerable was alone in his room, Tim promptly and without the smallest hesitation replied in the affirmative. Although somebody had passed into the room not 10 minutes before and Tim took a special and particular pride in preventing any intrusion whatever on either of the brothers when they were engaged with seeing a visitor, no matter who it was. I'll take this letter to him at once, said Nicholas, if that's the case. And with that, he walked to the room and knocked at the door. No answer. Another knock. Still no answer. He can't be here, thought Nicholas. So I'll lay it on his table. So Nicholas opened the door and walked in. And very quickly he turned to walk out again when he saw to his great astonishment and discomfiture a young lady 
upon her knees at Mr. Cheerable's feet. And Mr. Cheerable beseeching her to rise, and entreating a third person who had the appearance of the young lady's female attendant to add her persuasions to his to induce her to do so. Nicholas stammered out an awkward apology and was precipitately retiring when the young lady, turning her head a little, presented to his view the features of the lovely girl whom he had seen at the register office on his first visit long before. Glancing from her to the attendant, whom he recognised as the same clumsy servant who had accompanied her then, and between his admiration of the young lady's beauty and the confusion and surprise of this unexpected recognition, all he could do was stand stock still in such a bewildered state of surprise and embarrassment that for the moment he was quite bereft of the power either to speak or move. My dear ma'am, my dear young lady, cried Brother Charles in violent agitation. Pray, pray don't, not another word, not another word, I beseech and entreat you, I implore you, I beg of you to rise. We are, we are not alone. As he spoke, he raised the young lady who staggered to a chair and swooned away. She's fainted, sir, said Nicholas, darting eagerly forward. Poor dear, poor dear, cried Brother Charles. Where is my brother Ned? Ned, my dear brother, come here, I pray. Brother Charles, my dear fellow, replied his brother, hurrying into the room. What is the... oh, oh what? Hush, hush, not a word for your life, brother Ned, returned the other. Ring for the housekeeper, my dear brother. Call Tim Lincolnwater. Here, Tim Lincolnwater, sir. Uh, Mr Nickleby, my dear sir, leave the room at once. I beg and beseech of you. I, I, I think she's better now, said Nicholas, who had been watching patiently and eagerly, that he hadn't heard for the request. Poor bird, poor bird, cried Brother Charles, gently taking her hand in his and laying her head upon his arm. Brother Ned, my dear fellow, you will be surprised, I know, to witness that this in business hours. But here he was again reminded of the presence of Nicholas, and shaking him by the hand, earnestly requested him to leave the room at once and to send Tim Lincoln water without an instant's delay. Nicholas immediately withdrew and on his way to the counting house met both the old housekeeper and Tim Lincolnwater jostling each other in the passage and hurrying to the scene of action with extraordinary speed. Without waiting to hear his message, Tim Lincolnwater darted into the room and presently afterwards Nicholas heard the door shut and locked on the inside. He had abundance of time to ruminate on this discovery, for Tim Lincolnwater was absent during the greater part of an hour. During the whole time, Nicholas thought of nothing but the young lady and her exceeding beauty, and what could possibly have brought her there, and why they made such a mystery of it. The more he thought of all this, the more it perplexed him, the more anxious he became to know who and what she was. I should have known her among 10,000, thought Nicholas. And with that he walked up and down the room, recalling her face and figure, of which he had a peculiarly vivid remembrance, discarded all other subjects of reflection and dwelt upon that alone, her face and her figure. At length, Tim Lincolnwater came back, provokingly cool and with papers in his hand and a pen in his mouth, as if nothing had happened. Is she quite recovered? said Nicholas impetuously. Ho! Oh, said Tim Lincolnwater. Who? repeated Nicholas. The young lady. What do you make, Mr. Nickleby? said Tim, taking his pen out of his mouth. 
What do you make of 450 20, 27 times 3,238? No, 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 returned Nicholas. What do you make of my question first? I asked you about the young lady, said Tim Lincolnwater, putting on his spectacles. To be sure. Oh, she's very well. Very well, is she? returned Nicholas. Very well, replied Mr Lincolnwater gravely. Will she be able to go home today? asked Nicholas. Oh, she's gone, said Tim. Gone? Yes, I hope she has not far to go. And then Nicholas looked earnestly at the door and replied, I, I hope she hasn't. Nicholas hazarded, sorry, hazarded one or two further remarks, but it was evident from Tim Lincolnwater that his own, he had his own reasons for evading the subject and that he was determined to afford no further information respecting the fair unknown who had awakened so much curiosity in the breast of his young friend. Nothing daunted by this repulse, Nicholas returned to the charge next day, emboldened by the circumstance of Mr Lincolnwater sooner being found to be in a very uh, talkative and communicative mood. But he no sooner resumed the theme than Tim relapsed into a state of the most provoking taciturnity and from answering in monosyllables came to the returning, to returning no answers at all, such as were to be inferred from several grave nods and shrugs, which only served to whet the appetite for intelligence in Nicholas which had already attained a most unreasonable height. He wanted to know about the young lady. Foiled in these attempts, he was fain to content himself with watching for the young lady's return. But here again, he was disappointed. Day after day passed and she did not return. He looked eagerly at the superscription of all the notes and letters, but there was not one among them which he could fancy to be in her handwriting. On two or three occasions he was employed on business which took him to a distance and that had formerly been transacted by Tim Lincolnwater. Nicholas could not stop from ex suspecting that for, the some reason, for some reason he was being sent out of the way on purpose and that the young lady was there in his absence. Nothing transpired, however, however, to confirm this suspicion and Tim could not be entrapped into any confession or admission tending to support it in the smallest degree. Mystery and disappointment are not absolutely indispensable for the growth of love, but they are very often its powerful auxiliaries. Out of sight, out of mind is all very well as a proverb applicable to cases of friendship, though absence is not always necessarily to be equated with hollowness of the heart, even between friends, and the truth and honesty like precious stones are perhaps most easily imitated at a distance when materially assisted by a warm and active imagination, which has a long memory and will thrive for a considerable time on very slight and sparing food. Thus it is that it often attains to its most luxuriant growth in separation and under circumstances of the most utmost difficulty. And thus it was that Nicholas, thinking of nothing but the unknown young lady from day by day. So, Nicholas was thinking of nothing but the un, 
an unknown young lady from day to day and from hour to hour. And he began at last to think that he was very, very desperately in love with her and that he was never such an ill-used and persecuted lover in the whole wide world.